want to be free. I want to just live inside my Cadillac. That is my shit. And I'll throw it up. That's what it is. In my C A T I L L A C bitch. Can't see me through my tits. I'm riding real slow. If my paint wet, dripping, shining like my 24s. I don't got 24s, but I'm on those folks. That's those big white walls. Round spots. Old school like old English in that brown paper bag. I'm rolling in that same whip that my granddad had. Hello. What's up? This is Tate Fletcher with State Bulletproof with Tate Fletcher, and um, it's a fucking badass song that I just bored my friend Derek with a little bit for maybe the second time in 10 minutes. I want to thank uh, guys out there helping out, onutritionals.com. Uh, you can find them on the web, find them on Twitter. Uh, I'm not sure what that is offhand. I think it's at onutritionals or at functional coach where you can find all things pimping about functional fitness, diet, fish oil. If you're not taking fish oil, you hate yourself. And it's one of the nicest things that I've ever done for myself for just joint-wise, skin, energy. um, The the health benefits are innumerable. And uh, so at O-Nutritionals, O-Nutritionals O-Nutritionals.com, Original Nutritionals is the name of the company. Um, And uh, those guys are rad, easy to work with, and... um, really pay a high attention to their quality and their precision of their their ingredients and and they're very into uh, low impact harvesting for their products which is super important and it seems like more people are doing it while the scales get tipped the other way where corporations aren't really into doing it um 
Also, shout out to StrongerFasterHealthier.com. Uh, my friend Maddie, he's got a great set of uh, protein supplements out there. Really big in the CrossFit world, and I I love it. I love it, his stuff, and uh, I mix it with some coconut juice and, and smash it before I go to bed or after a workout or whenever. It's a it's a great little like meal replacement supplement um, to have if you're into protein. Um, what else? Oh, I'm, I might get a, an, an actual sponsor here with um, with uh, uh, sorry, we're driving right now, and so I'm on I-40 trying not to get pulled over while I talk in a microphone. Um, with uh, the San Diego-based company, and they also they they slang stuff from Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, California. They do sun panels and solar powered energy for your homes. They come and strap it on your home or business. And the cool thing about it, I'm not sure about California. I believe it's true there also. But if you get solar power, if you really are looking to get off the grid and and get corporations out of your pockets more and more, what can happen with that stuff is that that's all on the grid still and if you're generating power at your house in excess of what you use your local power company has to buy it back and so you can actually get paid for having electricity at your house so these kinds of systems um i think they go between 10 and twenty thousand dollars and i'm totally talking on my ass because i'm not sure i had a friend that put one on her house i think it was 12 or 15 but um you know after that initial investment is paid off you start getting checks every month from your your local utility company, uh, which is badass. And so, maybe more about that in the future. Um, yeah. And so I'm here with a buddy of mine, and we're just driving from New Mexico to uh, L.A. right now. And uh, so this is my first uh, interstate podcast. But uh, Derek Pritchard's his name, uh, fantastically talented. Uh, stuntman and womanizer from coast to coast maybe international i think we could say international um one of those guys that used to be very very good looking but now he's a little older uh so maybe like george george clooney type i'm thinking something like that i'll still take that yeah 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 uh and um just enjoying a beautiful day here in arizona right now uh just had some coffee and getting going but um all that stuff man uh you know, I've been thinking a lot more and more and more. I'm, I'm thinking about buying a building and and, um, and building my gym out in Santa Fe to a much larger degree and kind of then taking a couple aspects of it on an international basis um, as far as, uh, like, I don't, well, I'll tell, I don't know. I don't want to drop all that right now. But I'm thinking about getting the solar panels put on there and having the place be um you know with cisterns with solar panels and and build a little greenhouse on my property just to get as outside of the fray as i can because it's just terrifying for me right now when i look more and more at it and i think about i always have this vision of like of a little kid and his dad and the little kid looking up and going dad when when was it okay tell me what it was like when it was safe to go into the water and it's like we're just fucking right there right now like right now we're there you know and 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 i i, I saw some images a, a couple weeks ago and there was you know like uh the the soda can containers that packaged them all together wrapped around a little turtle that he'd obviously swum through and then it stayed and then he lived and it grew up and it, it completely uh molded his shell and it stayed wrapped around there forever it's it's there now and it's mutated the growth of this animal and and or you look at birds that are washed up with oil or what whatever the deal is whatever the natural or not natural but whatever the implications are on the natural environment from uh horrible oil spills or from just from man on on the community that we live on on earth and and looking at that is frightening I think for anybody that's a conscionable human because we got choices you either have like a cognitive dissonance like you have you've got to either agree that it's not that big a deal or yeah those you know people either look at it and they go oh those poor animals that's horrible or 
I mean, most people know about a Texas-sized island that floats in the Pacific of garbage, and there's a whole ecosystem built around that now of, of strange wildlife. Like, it's, it's phenomenal how we've altered the globe. We're the most adaptable creature ever biologically, and we're the only one that adapts our environment to meet our needs, and we're a virus that is plaguing the earth. And we either look at it like, like, oh, well, that's too bad, or fuck those animals. I'm not a duck. You know, bummer deal. But if you really look at it, you go, we're choking ourselves. Like that duck or turtle or whatever is, that, that's us. That we're, we're choking ourselves. And we're too fucking dumb to even realize it. And it's a tragedy. And that's why, I guess, talks like this and, and the Internet are so important. And that's also why conversely that things like CISPA and things like that that are up right now uh, for vote. I guess the Senate said today I'm not, I didn't read about it. I've been on the road but like they said something like they're not going to vote on it for some reason and a couple senators had something to say and then my Twitter blacked out and then I didn't read anymore but you know these, these are really important things that that uh, a lot of people like David Seaman and, and um his guest Abby Martin last night were talking about that it'll have wider reaching and more damning effects than things like NDAA or the Patriot Act uh, this will reach everywhere and, and alter the internet forever which has been a free source a, a free organic source of information and growth from its inception and now the United States government is looking to curtail that and block out and spy on it'll be this endless wiretap um, as my buddy Dan Steele says, like a, a just an open-ended wiretap on everything, on all communication. And that that's not frightening or that people think that, it, oh, it's a part, partisan issue or like we've got to get out of these ideas of Democrat, Republican or fucking I love the Sooners and you love the Broncos or whatever idiocy is out there and go, we are the, the self that we're choking right now. And, and this is how, um, so anyway, that that's kind of uh, what's been in my head lately. And so I've been going back into this idea of, like, how can you be self-supportive? Like, I don't want to fucking grow carrots or fucking kale or whatever. But I feel like I'm forced to because I look at that whole thing of that image with the little boy and his dad standing going, Dad, tell me what it was like to be safe in the water. And, and to now and going, you know, in my lifetime, going from drinking water out of the hose or out of the tap and it's no big deal... And I'll still do that in, in, in like Santa Fe, in some parts of the city, it, it comes from a clean ground swell and it's not all chlorinated and full of fluoride, but in other parts of the city, it's garbage and you can taste the chemicals in it. So that, that's one thing. So I drink purified water that I go and I buy, you know, and I buy it by the gallons. Um, and then pour it in containers and I'm trying not to fuck up the world with a bunch of empty little plastic bottles, but the the other aspect of that is like with the onset of Monsanto or any of that kind of jazz what how long before they're in bed with pharmaceutical companies we already know that the weed industry is and that they want you to have diabetes late late later so that you can then be a good customer uh for Upjohn or for whoever down the road what, what about when they start poisoning water directly like we can only drink bottled water now and then now it's completely tainted and there's chemicals in it that make you a Manchurian candidate or whatever. And I, and I don't think, I mean, people get after me a lot about the whole, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist or you're, it's like, at, at what point, like we have a history of poisoning people. I mean, they, they did it with the, the airmen in, in the 1940s, like the whole, the whole squadron of black airmen that they give syphilis to. It's like, we've been poisoning soldiers and our populace ever since somebody had the idea of mass water reaching everybody like for forever we have so why is it anything else outlandish i don't i don't understand that at all and and why is it that somebody's insane or a conspiracy theorist or paranoid if they're asking questions if they're going how come building seven came down that seems weird nothing hit that wild like so anyways uh that's the longest ramble I think I've ever had, but um, I'm here with a really good conspiracy theorist himself. Yeah, get me started. I'm sitting here watching all these military vehicles 
be transported around the country. It's the strangest thing. Have you noticed that every every other mile or so there'll be a big military convoy go by on semis? Like somebody's in charge of the tr- see right there. More yeah, it's a they, bunch they, of they Hummers. Yeah, this for the last. I'd say 100 miles, that's what's been happening, right? So somebody's in charge of allocating where these vehicles go. And uh, you think about that. Like, this is a domestic military movement of all these vehicles. Like, somebody's orchestrating that. Yeah. And when we get up here to Barstow, I'll show you, they probably got a billion dollars worth of vehicles sitting parked at that military base that you drive by. It's like, what? the hell do these vehicles do yeah there's a marine base or something there right yeah and it's some kind of a depot now because last time i went through there about two weeks ago there was literally uh five thousand vehicles sitting out there in the ground well i saw i was driving to work a month ago or something and i was driving from santa fe down to albuquerque and there and that's like a 45 minute drive everybody it's not a, a long ass way but there are these black trucks, all just black, and um, with federal plates on them. And they're oddly shaped. They're like a pickup truck with like a, a built-in enclosed steel camp camper on the back that's maybe six feet higher than a regular camper would be on a truck. And then an abutment that comes back with a door on it. Like just oddly shaped vehicles that I've never seen before. And I'm like, Man, that's curious. And I, and I look in it, and there's there's operators in it you know there's like obviously like special operators guys that are military dudes that are in it in in some kind of uniform but they're all the same uniform i'd never seen it before and one and it's not just dudes driving from santa fe to albuquerque like they're coming from somewhere because dudes are assed out like drooling mouth open sleeping in the passenger seat while the other guy's driving And, and i'm like they're coming from somewhere from denver or something and what what is this huge mobilization that's happening you know yeah, that's the thing that creeps me out is think about how many billions of dollars gets pumped into the infrastructure of military arms, like an, an event like Boston. Then all of a sudden there's a blank check because, oh, well, we better have, you know, all these special rated vehicles in every county. Every sheriff now can have a drone. Every every right. little county can literally have one of those vehicles you're talking about that are bomb-proof, bulletproof, have an arm on them and have machine guns all built in. It's like that's civilians that we're talking about. More than millions, I would think. They oh. were saying that the lady that, that sponsored CISPA, and it's only, there's like a couple of people that sponsor that bill and that are for it. Like Republicans, everybody's against it. But she stands to gain, I believe she's asking for $10 billion for her company to then put the wiretaps out and do the, um, do the software so that they can spy on people better, basically. But but it's all it's all just financially driven. It's all just like she wants to have a nicer summer home, so she's going to get ten billion dollars for a company, like under the auspices of national safety and national security, which to me is frightening. Like I'd heard that Seattle got drones, their police force, the Seattle police force, and then that there was such public outcry that they had to sell them back to the manufacturers. But now something like this event, this fucking yeah, horrifically traffic. Again. A tragic event in Boston happens, and now I'm sure that there's a lot of places that are coming back online with that. No, they figure there's 70,000 drones being sold nationwide now, domestically. Whoa! Yeah, it's a, it's the biggest boon for these companies that build these things, right? They just they don't have to now depend on foreign wars. They can sell them right here. You know, they use drones on that the cop San Diego cop that went a bonkers. Oh, with uh, Dorner, Chris Dorner. Dorner. Yeah, he he had drones. They were they were flying around drones looking for that guy on the manhunt. That's fucking crazy. Well, that's the um, the state where we are right now is one of such. You know, they they talk about there's a um, I don't know if it's a theory or what you would call it exactly, but where there's so much that is just. Uh, open and available like there's all this transparency and that it, it's where we're going it's where the government's going people are looking at people now everybody after boston is saying see we you know without cameras all, all you assholes that are out there i mean it's such a division too it's just another division of our country it's so sad to me but 
they say, look, all, all you people that are out there that are against cameras and think you're being surveilled and all this kind of stuff and you think it's so horrible, that's how they found these guys. They were able to get pictures of them planting bombs and everything. I'm like, well, how lucky is that? Like, if they're supposed to be whip smart, like terror organization guys, then I think they could avoid the cameras, A. And, and, and B, this is just something that now is saying, oh, see, now it's okay to have cameras. Now it's good to spy on people. But it is, the, it is that thing, man. Of, I was with Ari Shafir once, and we went down, and um, we are in Boston. And uh, strangely enough, Boston. And um, it was so, it was really sad, man. We, we were walking around, and there's this Holocaust um, memorial site. And there are these big, huge pieces of etched glass, basically, that, that go up, I don't know, maybe two or three stories. And there's little tiny names on each panel. And there's a panel for every death camp in World War II and all the names of everybody that's dead. And you look at something like that, and it just brings tears to your eyes when you just look at the lack of humanity and the eradication of, of a bunch of people based on fear and on nothing, really. And, um, and and seeing that and then they have this big plaque that typifies where we are now and it's where they were then you know they, they came for the socialists and I wasn't a socialist so I never said anything they came for the communists I wasn't a communist so I never said anything they came for the machinist I wasn't a machinist so I never said anything they came for the Jews I wasn't a Jew so they never said anything and by the time that they came for me there was nobody left to say anything yeah, it's and the it's, incremental steps it's like this creep they get, they get you used to seeing military in the streets and having martial law happen because it's our safety. And pretty soon, 10 years down the road, we're, we're sitting in a coffee shop and not, not astounded by military dudes asking for our papers. It's just normal. It's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I wonder always how much is hype and how much is fact on either side of it, like CNN misreported a bunch of news um, said oh there's been arrest made to where the feds told CNN please shut the fuck up respectfully we haven't made any arrests yet and you guys are saying that we've made arrests and so then they've got to recant but like you've got this sensationalized news source that's going out and then on the other hand of it you've got all these people that are saying oh well the government blew themselves up or what, like whatever on the other side and but we don't really know. Like with, I mean, like when I was working on Avengers, I saw this. These guys are fucking badass at at this stunt shop, eighty seven eleven, and and just not only in movement, but like in in uh, Photoshop and in, in videography, and and there's this little fight scene that's set up, and Captain America's kicking ass, and guys come out with guns, and and um, it's all we film it all, and then. You know, there's a scene where he whips the shield, boom, knocks one guy in the head, ricochets to another guy, hits a wall, bounces back to him, and then he smashes the guy's face with it. But there's no shield that's thrown. But inside of 20 minutes, um, dude's got a shield that's flying through the air and spinning, and you're like, that just happened. And I just saw it on video. And and uh, with bullet shots from the guns and the, the whole deal. Um and it looks 100% real. And it's like, if you can do that inside of 20 minutes, and you're a dude that's a badass stuntman, how about the government? What kind of fucking Photoshop do they have? Like, you could have, you could show anything. Like, and that was one thing when I was traveling with Rogan as a bodyguard, and it was a long time ago now, like maybe this was 06 or something, or 07, but we went to this dude that made uh, Gears of War, and into his, into his video game shop, and you're watching facial twitch. I mean, you, in the game is badass, like, with how lifelike it is. But th- that was a long time ago. And even at that time, the conversation was, could they make a human to look like a human and go and rob a liquor store? And he's like, absolutely, we can do that. And he says, and the government's way ahead of where we are in the private sector. And so that being the truth... You can like I, right then I was like whatever I see on TV isn't real anymore. All of it's all of it is a farce. A it can script. be it can be anything, and so you look at it like that, and and then so predicated on these that are perhaps lies or fictitious, we've divided the whole country into these different factions. You know what I mean? 
And then people are saying, God, uh, the gun control that came out over that was hilarious. It's like there's, there wasn't any bullets fired on that day. But people are like, see, we need more gun control. It's like, and all these distractions that get put out there. Like, here's another distraction. Here's another distraction. In the meantime, CISPA gets approved. Or in the meantime, NDA passes through on New Year's Eve. Or in the meantime, it's like, in the meantime, where's the real money happening? And the real money right now is is us being on the cusp of the highest inflation that the country's ever known, a devaluing of the dollar down to 10 cents on the dollar. And and things like in Cyprus and in Canada where they go, you know what, we're just going to jack all the people that have accounts here and we're just going to take 10, 20, 40, 50% of their money and we're going to see what happens. And and that's fucking crazy. Where So like the big monopolization of the of, of dollars, of capital is, I don't know, it's, it seems like that's the money grab. That's what's happening. And everybody bitching about patriotism here or there. It's like they're a bunch of adults that are just missing the point. It's actually genius how these constructs get happen you know the, the people that are thinking these things through are genius you know like the patriot act these these documents and legislation that have been put in place years before the events even happen in order to justify them uh, these people are smart they're thinking things through long term that's what i wonder about because i really want to get on on this podcast uh my friend tommy truex um a badass fighter, a fucking real American hero. Um, the guy's a, and and he's, you know, another soldier that is a. He was a career soldier, and he's disenfranchised with the way that you know, because he cares about men. He 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 loves the men he leads, and he goes out and he's like, you know, we're put under under the the these made up like these false flag events, and and then you're put in an impossible situation. And he says, I've got these young kids that then I'm in charge of their health, well-being uh, under the guise of a lie. And he says it's the worst It's the worst feeling ever. But he said that the thing is, is, is with this, we have our protocol in the Army of what's going on. And then the CIA has their protocol. And then the, um, you know, whatever factions that are, like all the different... I said, well, does the Army and the Marines and, like, the Air Force, do they ever get together and consolidate their information? And he says, never. He says, there's such um, lines of division with all those intelligence, the NSA, with all those intelligence agencies, that none of them work together. So they're always kind of battling against each other. I mean, and we saw that even with fucking Petraeus, right? Where the FBI is spying on the head of the CIA. CIA. What? Seriously? Like, yeah. no, nobody's getting it together. So you can't work with any function. So if we all know that, that there's zero functionality to what these constructs are, what are we doing and how do we break them down? And it's just like the selling of drones. The guys that sell the drones to Seattle, they give the drone back in Seattle. Do they go, oh, well, this was a bad business. I did. No. They, it never goes away. Once something pops open and an organization that makes money, that can, that can fleece money, is made, that'll never go away. The TSA, never going away. They, they're never going to catch a terrorist big. ever. They'll never catch anybody. They don't catch guns that go through all the time. I just brought through four bottles of fucking coconut oil. They got one of them and then let the other three go. It's like they don't know what's happening there because coconut oil is dangerous, folks. Absolutely. So you, know. you, put, you put coconut oil on the pilot's hands, that, you know, <laughs> that plane's going down. If you put it on a stewardess's hands, you'll get a totally different result. But that's a whole nother story. Things are still going slippery, no matter how you put coconut oil in it. The best sex story I heard, just to take a huge tangent was last night I think it's maybe the the best sex story I ever heard that, that there wasn't a lot of sex story in it there was some aftermath but you guys got to understand how good looking Derek is first wow and right. then go he, he travels the world and just does badass shit <laughs> and so he's down where, where are you you're in Mexico yeah I was in Mexico and and you meet a woman where as you do at a at a Froggies or horrible gringo club and uh, stunning. And what's she girl. look like? She's a Latina but American and lives down there giving massage. Just a real stunning, lovely, big juicy ass. Everything as the whole apparition. thing. Yeah, that's. What kind? What kind? Who does she look like? A famous person. Uh, 
Kim Kardashian with half the ass. No way. You guys are gorgeous. Okay. On a thin day too, not on a chubby day. No, this was this was mid month. All right, so then you, she she invites you back because you're a vagabond and a gigolo, and you don't have a place to go, and she does, right? So she's either going back to sleep on your BMW motorcycle. No, no, I'm, I'm at her crib because she's got a lovely little uh, rental in, I think it was Cabo San Lucas is where I was, in fact. Okay. And uh, you really want me to t- tell this story on your podcast? Yeah, well, if you want to. I mean, it's up to you. All right, so I'll go into it. So You know this is available for everybody, your mom and everybody. Oh. Anybody can find this. Changes anything. We can we can stop. We can we can pump the brakes right now. Uh, your call, man. It's your podcast. I love it. All right, here I, we go. I could I hadn't laughed so hard I couldn't even hardly yeah, sleep. That last was night. funny to hear you laugh. You got a great Holy laugh. Holy shit! So anyway, I meet this girl. We're we're uh, at a club. Really amazing woman. Sparks fly. Uh, the night progresses into a lot of debauchery with back in the days of drinking and tequila and and uh, this is Mexico, so you're eating, you know, dog tacos at the stand with 75 different salsas. Late night after the bar, Late just night, grubbing. Two, three in the morning, grubbing on the worst uh, food you could really put in your body at that hour after they're drinking 10 shots of tequila. So anyway, one le- one thing leads to the next, and uh, we wind up at her crib, seriously into each other, banging around, having fun, go off to sleep. Pretty bad. Beautiful setting. Uh, Open drapes, wind coming through right. the windows, exactly the whole deal. It. Yeah, chimes in the window. As really he described it, experience. like like crisp, white, thousand fluffy, thread count sheets. beautiful sheets and big, thick pillows. Yeah, with the, with the draping, mosquito netting, just really lovely setting. So anyway, uh, we go off to sleep. And when I wake up, the first thing I know... And you're, you're there spooned. You're, she's spooned up behind me. I wake up. And one of us has shat the bed, <laughs> for sure. That's just immediate. <laughs> the, like, factory. You, you open your eyes, and there's just an odor. It's there's there's shit somewhere involved. So, I <laughs> like I said, I'm laying facing the, the the windows, and she spooned up behind me. And for a long time, I just hoped upon hope that it wasn't what it was. But it was as I carefully lifted the sheets, I realized. It was me. I, I did it. I shat. <laughs> and not only shat, but big everywhere, all over her. God damn, just the visual of her spooning up against you and you exploding with some horrific yeah, diarrhea. In, in the middle of the night with a total stranger. That she doesn't wake up either, hammered drunk. Nobody's Nobody's got a sound mind. so nobody. They're like, oh, it's just warm and cozy. <laughs> oh, I laid there for 15 minutes trying to figure out what the dialogue was going to be when she opened her eyes. Oh my how to play that. God. So she wakes up or you get out of bed before she wakes up? No, no. Uh, she woke up. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> and then who speaks first? Does she go, what the, the like, what happens? No, you try to be uh, cordial, you know, like, good morning, sweetie. Uh, <laughs> this is going to come as a surprise. <laughs> but, I don't uh, know if you notice anything different about the bed. Yeah, these thousand thread count Egyptian cotton sheets. Holy uh, shit. I love you. Exactly. <laughs> I love you and you really, you fucked the shit out of me. <laughs> it's fucking awful. That's it's awful. I always terrible. hear a bad poop story about Mexico. Oh, you can't help it. That's My friend Norby, you know Norby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, man, he's another, he's another bad motherfucker, man. He... He, oh, he's uh, not scared of fecal matter. No, or or anything. He doubles uh, he doubles McConaughey and and Brolin and and, uh, and before that he's like a train jumping vagabond, and and like before he ever worked in films, I think that's what he was doing. And he jumps on a train and he goes down. And he's all through Mexico and he gets in like a, a jalapeno. I think it's a jalapeno eating contest yes, with with the guy's nephew that runs the food cart. The guy that runs the food cart's like. I won't eat that. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. um, and he's like, ah, ha, 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 just drunk, hammering back jalapenos, tacos, and he's hitchhiking through Mexico. He's trying to get back from South America, I think is where he was, and he's trying to get back um, from Peru back to Austin. So he's in Mexico, so hammered drunk. He ends up passed out. He gets a he gets a ride in a van, and uh, 
jumbling along, falls asleep in the back, curled up, drunk, noxious. And he says he wakes up abruptly to a horrific smell and a bunch of guys clamoring around him, yelling, screaming. The back of the van pussed open and he gets yanked out and dropped in the street. Everybody cursing him, spit at him. They jump in the van and they bolt. And he has shit everywhere. Like, and it's just, I, I can't, oh. Yeah. I had one coming up from uh, the, the coast of Columbia. Uh-huh. My buddy and I were taking a midnight bus ride up through one of the most heinous I mean, you leave from sea level what to year? like 9,000. This is in the early 90s. So we're going from this coastal town to La Paz, which is the second highest capital in the world, through one of the most deadly uh, roads in the planet. Like, it's just switchback after switchback. Jesus. So we're, we're in this little coastal town, and I'm sicker than I've ever been in my life. I'm so dehydrated from throwing up that I literally go into a little villager's house on, the, on a scummy river and, and beg for water. And they look at me like I'm insane, but I had to have water, right? So I'm drinking out of the tap of this place waiting for the bus to show up. Wow. My buddy and I get, get in line to get on the bus. And he's sick as well. And now what happens in, in places like that, the populace is just used to the parasites that are involved. Yeah, they're, they're And so it doesn't are, matter. I mean, but as, even, even them, they have trouble. They, really? The water's bad. But, yeah, they're a lot stronger. So we're getting on the bus, and he's in front of me. And as he's uh, stepping onto the bus, he's like, oh, God, oh, oh. And I stops the whole line. I was like, what what, what the fuck are you doing? He's like, I, I just shit my pants. <laughs> now, this is a nine-hour bus ride that does not no, stop. No, no. In a third-world country. And if you shit your pants, you're going to have to shit again. He said Like, nobody shits their pants, and they're like, oh, that's it. it Got it all it, out. It literally was the worst experience of my life. And I didn't even shit my pants. I just was near the dude. So he didn't stop. He didn't go clean up. There's nothing. There's no time, dude. You're in line to get on this bus, and uh, people are riding on the roof. You, you, if you can get a seat, you're oh happy. Oh, my God. And so we're trying to get to this capital city, La Paz, on a nine-hour bus ride. And in we go Columbia. all the way in the bus. I go all the way to the back. I'm sitting in the dead center aisle. He's sitting next to me. Smells like shit. You got La Bamba music blasting through tweeterless speakers. Smoke. Everybody's scared, terrified, because they know what they're experiencing on this ride. So everybody's smoking. Oh. And uh, nine hours on this bus ride. Heinous. One of the worst experiences I've ever had in my life. We never think about how lucky we are. Oh, God. It's all, you know, and people always, they woof a bunch of shit about the U.S. of A. But God bless America, man. Yeah. Like that, like public transportation in other places is horrific. You hear about girls that are getting raped in the middle of a crowd and nobody can do anything and they can just kind of stand there and take it. Like you hear about all kinds of shit. Like there's zero privacy. Like oh. in India bus rides, I had a friend that went through there. They're like, you're just right up. People are basically sitting on half your thigh and have something just smashed oh, in together. There's, you're there's breathing their relationships. Spit. They, they have no problem being in your bubble. And they're, they're happy about it. They're like, hey, how yeah, are you? Like, yeah. They don't think that it's yeah. weird for you. Like, They can't imagine that how strange that is for us as Americans going there. Like, They're just... No wonder we seem a little off-putting to fucking other countries and other cultures. Just in the looks on our faces when somebody sits on our lap. Like, Anybody would think that yeah. was weird. But no, not anybody. Yeah, not just invited. Americans. Yeah. I need my little bubble. That is a trip. Yeah, that's what Norby said, too. He's, like, traveling through there. You just get a different appreciation for humanity. And, like, we are all really in this together. And, there, I mean, there's a beauty to that. You know, there's that's a great that's a great prism to look at life through, really. And then and then to get out of it, get back to America is the other aspect. Or there's of toilet it. paper at rest stops and That's stuff. the thing, right? I was just reading at that last rest stop uh, we stopped at. There's a, a global color-coded map. And it has blues and reds and yellows, and then it has a key underneath, and and it shows the blue is, um, it goes lowest to median to highest incomes per capita, and it starts at like, and it's by the year, and it starts at I think like twelve dollars and under a year is the first one for the lowest, and then it's between. 400 and 6,000 and then it's 6,000 to 12,000 or, or maybe it's 12,000 and above for the highest like really broad scales but like 12,000 that's that's the highest and that's America Europe and Japan and little bits little cities throughout Australia but the rest 
are all reds and yellows. And that's everywhere. Africa, well, that's Brazil. Brazil's beautiful, man. And Brazil is like a, I, don't, I mean, I, I tell my Brazilian friends that that's a nice third world country. You'll never be a superhero. But um, that's a, it's a rad, like, first world country with beautiful amenities. And, I mean, it's got everything depending where you go. But if you're in the cities, man, that is, it's an opulent city. Uh, of, of like Rio or Sao Paulo oh, yeah. or Belas Ranch. Um, however, that's still considered a low to mid grade population because there's so many people that are so poor. It just takes whatever opulence it is and just brings it right down to the dirt. And and you look you look at graphs like that and you look at like if if you shit in a toilet, you're one of the six percent of the world that can do that. Or something. It's like there's crazy statistics yeah. about that that I just take for granted every day that I never ever ever think about. Like it is amazing. Oh, there's fringe, man. I, I was trying to get to Bogota and we were in a in a bus driving through uh, South America and literally when you're 30 miles outside of Bogota, you yeah. enter into like shanty camps, right? T- like literally cardboard structures. Are you and worried when you go through there about getting killed, like sure. drug yeah. gangs or like who's who's or just crazy like who's who's gonna get you yeah back then being a gringo in Colombia was not cool like it literally uh was one of the most dangerous cities in the world but i'm not exaggerating when i say we drove 30 miles through shantytown like 30 no, miles no uh sanitation no no grocery stores what was that what was that movie where the aliens came down and they just lived in a ship hovering over somewhere in, in uh in cape town or somewhere in africa what, what was that movie? Do you remember? There and there's shanty towns just like what you're describing. That just went on and on and on for miles square miles. miles. Yeah, and there's some kind of order in the even in the chaos. Like there's people living there, and they establish their social networks right. and their hierarchy and their pecking orders and all that. The same as any city yeah. or any prison structure or any gang or any like the microcosm mimic the macrocosms. Always, it's man. Crazy. That's what I'm seeing more and more. It doesn't matter. I would see that in school, in high school. I was talking with a buddy the other day with uh, uh, one of my students at the gym, Conrad, and he's a great writer. He writes screenplays and stuff. And I was saying, you know, like for every group, there's another group that mimics that group in whatever. That we're talking about archetypes of people. And like in, in my group in high school, there's there's Big John and there's Rory and there's Tucker and there's Scully uh, there's Marco there, you know and there's you know five or eight guys and one dude's really quiet the other dude's a real brainy and the other dude's a real bleeding heart and the other dude is a real ass kicker and the other dude's a heavy drinker like there's there's all these different and, and I'm like and then I look at the year below me and I'm like wow dude Reed's group is just like this group and then I look at the yearbook. I'm like, there's these microcosms that are just mimicked over and over again. And we're just this repetition of ourselves virally across the world. And, and whether you see that in small groups in little high schools and little towns, or you go, well, that's representative of the city. It's almost like there's a, there's a balance that has to be maintained of like, here's the brainy one. Here's the strong one. Here's the romantic one. Like, and there needs to maintain an equilibrium and a homeostasis. Yeah, any tribe is... There has there, to be that balance. There has to be different roles. No, not everybody can be the same. Otherwise, yeah. Unless you're in a boy band. It reminds me of that scene, too. In the, in, do you ever see Mobsters? No. It was, it was, I love it. It was awesome. It was like... Uh, who's the dude that's Jack Nicholson, but he's younger? Christian Slater? Christian Slater, yeah. He was in it, and then... I forget the other guys' names. I'm so bad with those guys' names. But um, there's a great scene in there, and, and Lucky Luciano is sitting there with maybe it's like Meyer Lansky or something, right? Like yeah. the real brainiac Jew of the thing. And he's like, I'm clearly the leader, and Lucky Luciano is like the better looking and the more talkative and the, all that. And, and he's like, I, you know, I don't care who the leader is. Meyer's like, I don't care who the leader is either. We don't care how we're going to figure this out because we have to have a leader for our little our little clique here. And and he goes, here's what we're going to do. And uh, he gives, I don't know, $10 or something to one of the guys. He says, I want you to go out there and find a newspaper boy and uh, give him this envelope and tell him to come in and 
give it to the to the boss man. And so they said, all right, cool. And so it's just a arbitrary test, right? That's outside of the realm of in, anything except this little boy's Who assertion as a little towards, street yeah. urchin, like selling papers, trying to make it. Like so, his animal instincts are strong. And they're sitting there, and they both fix their ties and shit. And they're sitting at the table, and it's a round table. They're both nobody's at the head, or nobody's. And he's like, "We're gonna go by this. This is we're gonna agree that whoever the boy picks, that's the guy, right? Yep." And boom, and he comes in, and he fucking picks the dude. He's like, "Okay, you're the leader, you know." You're and and then there's the brains behind the leader, you know, kind of thing. And there's, but all that stuff is represented and has to be. You've got to have those divisions or those not those, but those roles assigned, basically, you know. And they happen naturally, you know. And then I think that was a unique situation, just because they're two equally kind of strong and vibrant men. But it's got to happen, or else there's an imbalance that won't function. Like, and that is that's the other thing too with this. With nature hates something that won't function, and us as this arrogant human species is coming through trying to make things function that don't function, trying to impose and make the earth adapt to us, trying to make. We're trying to change laws of physics yeah. for ourselves. And we've got all these constructs that are built upon greed that do not fucking function that we're trying to force to function. Well, we've been faking it because the, the numbers just aren't there. Like, once there's 9 billion, 12 billion, 15 billion people, right. you can't fake it. Like, Was that you that was telling me the numbers that were like, all the people that have ever lived on the earth ever are only like 12 billion? Or something like that that no, have ever ever lived, and now there's only seven billion or whatever. But it's like you think of the short time that that means. That oh, it's we've exponential! Been oh my lord! Yeah, closing in on eight billion, exponentially growing. That's why malaria and big big diseases like that will never be cured, even if there is a cure. <laughs> the big the big Rothschilds and the Vanderbilts they're into population control that they, they think about these long-term things. Do you think so? Absolutely. I always think the about that it helps those guys, you know, that... Oh, I, well, a, like there's a, a balance, right? you got to have a certain right. amount of slaves, yeah, exactly. but you don't want it tipping the scale to where you actually suffer because the air and the it's water... It's so weird, too, that you say slave. I mean, it is. I mean, people think they're free. Oh, such That's an the, illusion. That's such a trick. It's such a beautiful illusion. I love... Rogan said it best, man. He goes... We're... We're driving to the airport or something one day in LA and, and uh and on the 405 and he's like god can you imagine being stuck on this slave ship twice a day every day for your life and I was like that is what this is I mean you know that oh, becomes yeah. a parking Backroom. lot at those hours you know what I mean and if you have to be on it you that that is the slave ship you're on you're on the slave ship going to the slave job to make sure that your fucking phone bill gets paid or you can pay your rent or whatever to get back on this oh my god no it's a constant grind i mean people think they're free but once the system entraps you and they're in they're, yeah they're in that construct of a system and going i like obama yeah or, i like romney yeah. or i like like they're really here for me it's like man you don't even see that you're in a trap like none of, no nobody's on your side those issues don't matter those are all distractions it's fucking wild I wonder how the function of this car is going to keep going on this little bit of fuel, this fossil fuel that we're so dependent on. Seems great. We're driving my brand new Mini Cooper, and brand new for me means it's a 2011. So what's up, bitch? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Like as far as as far as uh, when you talk about when we were talking last night and you were saying, well, we're, you know, I get so dark about it and I want to go off the grid and like, you're one of the most off the grid guys that's on the grid that I know. Like you live like a, like, I mean, you live like the film business basically, like you're a vagabond film and and, yeah, a gypsy, like Derek, you you drive around in a great, it's a tight vehicle. You're, you, you know, you haul your trailer around, pack it up, Go and live here, live here for a year or six months or three weeks or however long it is, then go to trailer it to the next place and to the next place. And and uh, and you always talk about, you know, as long as I get a steady income of, of five grand or ten grand a year, I'd be gone. I'd just be in the wind and just living. And that in itself is a different kind of spirit than most of us have. Well, we're taught from so early on that what the American dream is, is literally entrapment. It's like... You know, college, 
got to have college to get the good job, and then you can get the car, and then you get the house, and you get the wife and the 2.5 kids. This whole ingrained thing, this message and programming happens from a very early age. So what is it that makes you not scared? I mean, and by not scared, what I mean is what I see guys, even when they get a shot at freedom, they cleave to their house or to their weekly check or to whatever. Even if they could get free, they really don't want freedom. I mean, even me, like I get into a place, dude, where I'm like, like last week I had to go like, dude, the concrete cowboy in Dallas. If you guys live in Dallas, holy fuck. The concrete cowboy is just off the hinges there, man. It, it, it is an amazingly beautiful club, well-staffed. My boy Rico, my partner over there, um, you know, there's a few guys. There's Dan and Rico and and and, uh, and John Dolan and um, I want to say Mindy McKenzie too, and uh, and then John Vals. But man, R- Rico run, runs the ship over there. He and John do, and the kind of the function and beauty of that place is tremendous. Um, so I just want to give a little shout out to that. That's a nice plug. But. As if, I mean, Jesus, if it, as if it needs a plug, that place is just steady, <laughs> packed. It's crazy. But even to go there, like I've got an investment in this thing, you know, and, and, and Rico's a good buddy of mine for, it's so weird, like almost, it's got to be 15 years or maybe, it's been a long ass time since I've known Rico. Um, great friends with his brother Chacho and then, uh, anyway, and I've been trying to get out there for a year. And so even me trying to go out, to what would be a complete vacation would be I'm like oh just making the plane ticket I'm like I'm like I'm gonna forget something or I'm gonna like it's hard for me to get out of my routine and that that whole my, my whole life has been go do something uncomfortable today get out of your routine every day of my life and it's made all the difference but it's not something that comes easy to me no. and so I can understand when people are like I hate this town and they believe like there's a fence around the town and they can't get out and change their circumstances when I know in my heart that every choice that you make has brought you to where you are today nobody's a victim of anything and and but then there's a guy like you that's just like you just fucking can throw a knapsack on you don't even care what you leave behind get on your motorcycle and leave for three months like that's a freedom of a mind in a whole different way than most of us experience. And I'm wondering what's been the difference for you with that? Or do you even recognize it? No, it's definitely a conscious choice. I mean, it's hard sometimes. It's very hard to not. And believe me, I have my own issues with value and how the system puts uh, trinkets in place for you to to suck you into the system. I mean, look at, look at technology and Apple. I'm a victim of it. I have a perfectly... A good working computer and yet I'm already looking at how to upgrade because shit two years goes by and then everything's you know inadequate really like because this one performs two seconds better two, 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 you know right so it's real hard to, to fight that construct these are programs that have been ingrained early on like consume but you, and you started traveling but I guess that's you grew up in a way like like I was a criminal and I like, and so I, I was. I I'd really say was. I, <laughs> I, I'd really, you know, attached myself to the crew of guys that I knew and trusted and loved, and areas that I was used to moving in. So it was like that trapped me in a, in a, in a, for a long time, you know. But like for you, at, at similar ages, it's like you grew up in Alaska, born in Alaska, right? I was born in Texas, but yeah, blessed to grow up in Alaska. And then you had a really fucking different childhood than nearly anybody that I know that's not stayed in Alaska or stayed in some removed thing like that. Like, so maybe that was part of it. Yeah, I think maybe nature growing up around. Like you were an original ice road trucker. I did the, some of that, yeah. That's, that's a, a horrible <laughs> thing to do. So How'd you get into that? Just uh, one of those uh, aspirations of fate and knowing people i always wanted to to work on the oil on the oil work up in a because Bay. that was like the good that's job that's what you did yeah, yeah. as an 18 year old that that's was, like in michigan if you can get a uaw big. job that's your you got a good job stay with that yeah yeah no that's uh that's a big thing when you can work two weeks on and two weeks off and i i got into the schedule of commercial fishing and working on the oil rigs and it was seasonal work so you'd work literally a couple of months and then you had month months off and so that that scheduling really so I, you worked on I boats too. With it. Oh yeah, commercial fishing. So you did like all the shows that are fucking reality shows. You've done yeah, all that. You're yeah, Ice Road Trucker, 
Deadliest Catch. Yep. What else? Uh, Survival Man. Nah, that's next. <laughs> that's where I go off the grid completely. Me and a me and a uh, uh, Leatherman. Some duct tape. Yeah, awesome. And this podcast. Yeah, I'm sold. Maybe a lighter. <laughs> So yeah, I was blessed to, to have a whole different paradigm. I just and knew. So that what what at what age are you doing that? Are you trucking? Are you fishing? Or all I, that? I shit? was seventeen. Well, no, fishing was fifteen, sixteen. No way. Seventeen. And yeah. you would go for two weeks at a time. Well, fishing's out there. You're out there at sea for weeks, months. You're at fifteen years old. Yeah, I was commercial fishing at with fucking animals. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. God bless yeah, all you fishermen yeah, out there. No, but go fuck yourself that's for a real, real too. Job. That's like a that's real. you guys. You guys know you're savages. God bless you. You have to be. To survive that, that, you have to be a savage. What kind of fellowship is there? And they're like, I mean, there's, we talk about caste systems. There's got to be like, are dudes getting thrown off the boat if they're douchey? Like, what what happens? You know, because you're in situations where dudes are going to die. Oh, yeah. Every day is a death trap. But the funny thing is, is I don't know why it's a universal law, but usually skippers are just some maniacal, fucking horrible human being. And they're the guys that could last long enough to become a skipper. Yeah. Yeah, be yeah, awful. You, yeah you're a monster. It's so, like a gang boss but, in prison. It's like that's the lifer that's done the most heinous shit. That's right. He's, he's a survivor and he's there for a reason. But I'll tell you, there's, <laughs> a, there's a funny uh, joke about the whole fishing industry is they find skippers floating around in the Bering Sea with their no pants down. No way. Because they were taking a leak over the edge of the boat in the fucking crew that hated them. Oops, did a little bump. And uh, it doesn't take long. A couple minutes in that water, it's over. I can't imagine. A friend of mine, uh, uh, my, I don't know if he's my brother. I don't know how that shit works. But he's related through marriage. And my sister, my sister married his dad, I guess, who's a lot older than my sister. And so then his son is... A lot older than we're directly anyway. Really cool guy named Jared. And he was going, he lived in Alaska, born in Alaska, sea kayaker, uh, mountain biker, downhill skier, you know, like uh, all the stuff. If you survive in Alaska, like that's a certain kind of toughness right there. He says that he goes out, he, he went out kayaking just in the river. And, um, and he said he had a misshapen um, skirt that holds all the water out. And so he, he was going down the river, and he started taking water in. And it's only like three feet deep, he said, where he was. And I'm like, well, no big deal. You just fucking get out and walk out or whatever. It's like not that big a deal. He said, oh, no, it's hairy, dude. And I'm like, he says, I was lucky that I was with a bunch of other people. I'm like, well, why? He says, because that water hits you. He says, you can get shock right away and drop. And you can die right there before you can get six feet to shore. He's like, it, it's like that. Let alone if you flip and you, you dunk your head or... Just get he water says, in around it, your legs. Yeah, he says, it's serious. He says, so I never go kayaking without a group of people. It's just foolish to you. You would never do it. I'm like, wow, dude, that yeah. is a place... That's a whole different kind of place to live. That's the interesting thing and kind of the beauty of Alaska is literally... You can die 20 minutes outside of the main city of Anchorage, where there's 250,000 people. Or in Anchorage. I was there for her wedding, and there's people that are dying. You get drunk and die. You know, yeah, everybody gets that. drunk and sleeps outside their doorstep, or you get lo- you die in Alaska. You what freeze. I like about that extreme part of... The real, real dummies die. <laughs> Is that what you well, like? I there's made a, it. I, there's I a selection. <laughs> I, I did okay. But the... Uh, the fact that it's kind of a community that I, you're in something that you know everybody's experiencing the same thing. So if you're driving along the road in the middle of the winter and somebody's broken over, right. you pull over. Yeah. That's community because that yeah. person could die. Yep. Like Santa Fe, I went to pull over in the middle of the winter because I saw a car that had slid off the road. And as I slid past them, it was very icy and snowy. And as I slid past and got behind them, I saw two dudes run around the front of the truck. You know, there was a, a girl out on the street. Right flagging everybody down because you were she was run off the road but two dudes were hiding there who knows what that was that could have been a wow a, a serious carjacking yeah but in alaska you, you pull over you stop that's in nebraska too uh uh nate and conrad were telling me about a big s- storm that came and it's just there's you know 30 miles between all these little tiny tiny towns and he's like man people get lo- like a blizzard comes on so fast and people get snowed in, and they they're found frozen in their car six days later or whatever because nobody can go anywhere because it's such a, a snowpack. God damn. Yeah, that's the thing. When I worked on the oil rigs up in Prudhoe Bay in the on the Arctic Circle, the uh, the temperatures in the winter are literally fifty below ambient. And you're in water. Well, no, that was up on the oil rigs on on land uh-huh. on the frozen tundra, but 
the if your vehicle dies, like if you're off the camp, out of the man camp, right, as they say, uh, your vehicle dies, you die. Crazy. Yeah. In, in Michigan, we'd go around with little like votive candles, and I mean, smart people had them in their cars anyway, because if you got stuck somewhere. The idea is that you can you can light that and it'll keep your car warm enough that you won't freeze to death. Hmm. Like, which is wild. But it's wild that you think about that. It's 2013 and we're thinking about that. Survival, yeah. It's, that's nutty, man. But I mean, that but that is the thing. I kind of like that in a way of like it's like respect nature, bitch. Respect it. Don't make a fucking golf course in Phoenix again, you assholes. Like Jesus Christ, you know. I mean, it's almost as if. There's lakes in Phoenix. When you fly over it and you look at all the pools there, it's like, yeah, green, oh, green, my God. In the middle of a brown desert. It's There's days there when I go to Scottsdale and I'm like, it's humid here, which is completely wrong. Like, it just feels wrong. Like, this is so unnatural that there would be humidity here. And they're spritzing the sidewalks with water. There's spritzers around so that you can have a, a enjoyable shopping experience. It's As the nuts. aquifers get lower and lower, well, and where lower. does that even water even come? Like that is amazing to me. My mama was talking about in Santa Fe how they're the, the trouble with the drought and how we're moving into like a Sahara or what, whatever the there's there's a name for that um, geographically of that type of terrain and we're going from like a high desert to like a Sahara or to a, whatever the drier climate is. And I'm like, uh, how is Santa Fe like that? And Phoenix is just wasting water by the lake full. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, just different different aquifers. Some, some are bigger and deeper than others, but Santa Fe is drying up. There's no doubt. So what's up What's up? Uh, when you're on a boat and you're 15, and what are your sleeping conditions? What, are, what Like, what's it all look like? You don't sleep much. It's uh, when, when the fishing season's open, you're out there fishing. That's what Do you do try to fuck you? We'll define try. <laughs> no, it's a. It's is there? A I mean, is there a horrible, heinous, heinous like hazing that happens, or is everybody like, oh, we're here together, and it's these guys? And how many guys are there? Are there twelve? Are there thirty? Depends, depends on what, but what fish you're after, or what what industry you're doing. But uh, like the salmon fishing, it's very small crews. You have two or three guys on the back boat, and it's literally nine hundred feet of net that you're putting out my wow. first season the, the boat i went out on and didn't big it, winches didn't, well that's the thing the first season i went out on didn't have a winch so we hand pulled oh and hand through 900 feet of net every time you must have been worthless as a i mean i would be pissed if i was next to a 15 year old kid and we're doing work like that yeah i was i was all heart man i pulled that shit in wow but at the end of a three-month season you can't even open your hands yeah just pulling net and salt water oh, so you're cracked so bloody terrifying. and cold yeah, it sounds it, rad. And what do you get paid for that? Comparatively, uh, nothing. Like the amount of hours and stress and danger. So you're out for how long? Like on that would be out for three months typically. And then you get a check for 40 grand? Yeah, or? 40, 40, 50 if you had a good season. Fuck. And then wait one year, we, we slammed into another boat the first day of the season. No way. And uh, literally, didn't I didn't make a dime. We spent the year trying to fix the boat. No way. I think we might run out of gas, my friend. You shut up. So my my brother-in-law, Jeffrey Gross, he's apparently starting. Uh, he started the sea kayaking business. And then he does. He's just badass, man. He's just a wicked athlete, just a really fucking cool, humble dude, and he does heliskiing like he's a guide for heliskiing and now i think he's gonna buy a fishing boat to do salmon fishing like what you're talking about oh it's tough the middleman now the only people that make money in the fishing industry are literally the middle the, the, the retailers so you don't think if you're an owner operator that uh, that's a so it's the, the permits the, the licensing is so expensive like up where i was it was five hundred thousand dollars just for the license and boat is another hundreds of thousands of dollars you got how much how much for a boat like that like how big is that boat 20 feet or 50 the feet boat we were on on the, the salmon industry was uh 32 feet all of them can only be 32 feet and when you wreck into another boat is that jostling for position for the good fishing spot yeah, or what happens the, that's the poetry of that you get 
1,400 boats in one little area, all with 900 feet of net. 1,400. Yeah, so it was it was combat warfare with commercial fishing boats. Do they shoot at each other? Yeah, and they're banging on they're, each other and they're shooting. They're and guns? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was rough. It was the Wild West. Like actual guns, like not yeah, like yeah, flare guns or whatever? Yeah, shooting. Trying to shoot holes in the bow to sink people. And, I no mean, it shit. It was literally war. Are they trying to kill people or are they just trying to uh, fuck the boat up so you got to go back to shore? Byproduct of each. It, people die then it's a it's a good thing if the boat sinks uh, it no. was it was rough i guess if they shoot a guy and they've got to take him back then or whatever that's a good thing too yeah less competition what about um polar bears uh not where i was but up in the arctic circle on oil rigs we saw polar bears. you ever seen one yeah yeah i Did saw one right up next to the window of a big crew cab how big i don't know fuck huge bigger than the fucking car I saw one on a two-story bus. There's some video, and uh, it stood on its hind legs, and it could reach the top of the bus. Like, just ridiculously large animals. And yeah. they come out as predators, I guess. But when I went up there to visit my sister, she's like, well, you know, we went snow machining and skiing and all this. And she's like, well, what else do you want to do? You know, you're up here in this really unique spot. I'm like, yeah, I said, I want to go and uh, I want to hunt a polar bear. She's oh. like, hey, they're... They're endangered, asshole. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, we got to hurry. I mean, that's, there's only so many, Alex. She's like, you are a jerk. Yeah. But I'm thinking they're just dying anyway of exposure as the temperatures rise or whatever. I want to get a you badass a polar bear coat. Dude, I could have a coat and a rug. Those things are so big. Imagine how badass a full-length polar bear coat oh, yeah. would be like a huge collar to, oh if you could just have some baby seals you know club some baby seals in that same trip well just use their eyes for buttons oh that'd be slick lacquer lacquer them up sick huh yeah that's a that's a look my sister was not into it but if anybody knows how to do that if i can get on a polar bear hunt man how do you get one of those skins because in my dream house that i'm going to build i want my floors to be just covered in big old polar bear skins ted nugent probably knows how he and I seem to have different politics, though. I don't think that would work out. Yeah, he writes dinner music. He's, he's more refined. I, I don't know what he's doing now. I just downloaded a bunch of his music recently, but some badass stuff like Paralyzed or like that Fred Bear, shit like that. Man, he was wicked back in the day. Oh, yeah. But I think he took a turn for crazy. You know what's interesting? No, he's a smart dude. I doubled him on that uh, beer, for, beer for My Horses. He's, right. He... Uh, He's, he's so conservative. Been, he's he's so on that end drunk. of things. He's never done drugs. Right. Ever. That's a rocker. Yeah. Back in the 70s and 80s, that dude. You look met, at his eyes on his album covers, too, and you tell me he's not on crystal meth right now. Or so, like, you just don't believe it. But, like, I've heard that, too, that he's never done any Never that, done any drugs. Super arrogant, too. I remember I was living in Lansing, and he came on the local radio station. That You know, he'd do call-ins, and it was like, it's right around when Kurt Cobain died. And... He goes. He's the, he goes into his what a loser kind of thing, da 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 da, and then he's like, you know, I could have really helped him if he'd have given me a call. I could have saved that guy's life, and and I'll, going yeah. into this whole diatribe yeah, about he's, like he's got an ego. He's just gonna outsmart it, and then he talks about a guy. He was in a band called the Amboy Dukes uh, back before he was big as Ted Nugent, and he goes, yeah, and my you know my drummer he um, took his kid like an eight year old kid or something. They're down in Miami and they're copping some rock. And they get machine gunned by a bunch of Haitians or whatever. Just get caught in a crossfire. They, I think they both got killed. And he's like, you know that dumb shit? He's like, out there, you know, I could have made a difference. And he just threw his life. And, like, no understanding of addiction. Yeah, no talking. empathy. No, there's a child that he's talking about that's dead. And all he's like, you. I was like, wow, that is a, that's a different kind of way yeah, of looking at life. Yeah. What do you got going on? Ed Durant's trying to get my fucking picture. I can't believe that we're out here in the boonies. Are you on AT&T or are you on Verizon? AT&T. Yeah, me too. This isn't going to work in these canyons. No. We're in I-40. There's all these canyons. We're in elevation and then low and then back up again. Thank goodness this is just getting recorded. It's not a live broadcast because you would not ever hear it. You're going to be able to ed edit this, right? <laughs> All right. We're going to pull over. We'll continue this later. 
and uh, I don't know how long these will be broadcast, one or one or the next, but um, thank you all for listening. Remember, hit up uh, O Nutritionals, Original Nutritionals, at, uh, at Functional Coach or at O Nutritionals. I think on Instagram and Twitter, same thing. Um, SFH, uh, StrongerFasterHealthier.com for all your protein needs for big, strong bodies and athleticism. And, uh, man, go do a little something every day. Every day, man. Do something a little uncomfortable and make that commitment to yourself. It makes all the difference, even if it's just 10 minutes. I always tell people, man, I'd rather have an athlete that will work hard for 20 minutes a day consistently than a guy that will come in now and again once a week and break his ass for three hours. That guy will be a loser forever. The guy that disciplines himself, gets a little consistency, you can't stop that dude. That's an animal. That's a whole different animal. And that grows into greatness. And uh, you're all great. Thanks, motherfuckers. We'll talk again soon.